So, it is my pleasure to have come here to honor my good friend, Dr. Werner Franke. There are a lot of us in this world that are passionate about the fight against doping. There is no one more passionate about it than Dr. Franke. <laughs> so what Werner has asked me to talk about is using investigations uh, to prove doping cases against the athlete's entourage. Um, I have lots of pictures. Sadly enough, I have no rabbits and no frogs. <laughs> In fact, no furry animals at all. I'm going to illustrate my points by telling you two stories. The first story is the Balco investigation of 2003, 2004, 2005. And the second story is the U.S. Postal Service investigation involving Lance Armstrong, 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and ongoing. Okay? So I'll start with the Balco story. The man behind Balco was Victor Conti. Uh, Victor Conti although he turned out to be a very successful doping advisor, was not a scientist. His job before forming Valco Laboratories was as a guitarist in the rock band Tower of Power. What he said, and there's some truth to this, was it's not cheating if everybody's doing it. And when we've heard today about you wouldn't dope, because you don't want to cheat. It's a very different world when you believe that everybody's doing it. I'll jump forward. We had a case against Michelle Collins. Um, we showed her the documents that made it perfectly clear that she was doping. She didn't have a positive test. We met with her in the Houston airport. And she said, I didn't dope, I didn't dope, I didn't dope, I didn't dope. Michelle Collins won the 200-meter indoor championship. And just as we were leaving, we said, fine, we'll, we'll bring the case. Uh, Terry Madden, who is the CEO of the U.S. anti-doping agency, USADA, said, Michelle, I've got one question I just need to ask you. So I know you didn't dope, but there you are lined up in the starting blocks of the finals of the two women's 200-meter, and there's seven women on either side of you. How many of them do you think doped? Median answer, all of them. So it's a little hard to talk ethics when an athlete believes that by doping, they're simply leveling the playing field. So here's the quick story on Balco. Summer of 2013, USADA gets a call from a reporter in Raleigh, North Carolina, who says, there's a coach down here. He wants to remain anonymous, but he says there's a designer steroid that you guys can't detect that track athletes are using. Would you like to talk to him? And the answer was, yeah, we would like to talk to him. And we talked to this coach who remained anonymous. I will tell you that it turned out to be Trevor Graham, Marion Jones, Tim Montgomery, and Michelle Collins' coach, who had had a falling out with Victor Conti, and he was trying to get back at Victor. We talked to him. He was still anonymous, but he said there's a lab in San Francisco by the name of Belco, and there's a bad guy by the name of Victor Conti who's going around to athletics meets with his black bag, and he's giving out designer steroids. And then he said, you know, I happen to have a used syringe with some of this compound in it. Would you be interested in that? And the answer, well, yeah, we would. Um, so he sent the syringe, and then he also told us that I can tell you at least some of the athletes who are using this. And he gave us a list, including Dwayne Chambers, fastest man in Europe in time, Regina Jacobs, the best U.S. distance women's runner ever, and some other names. So the next step was for us to figure out a way to identify and then test for this designer steroid. We gave the syringe to Don Catlin at UCLA. He reverse engineered the drug, and he said, guess what? It really, it is a designer steroid, and if we use our typical derivatization technique, it's undetectable. 
it breaks down in the derivatization process. So I need to come up with a new derivatization process, and he did, and then he had a way to test for the drug. Problem was that back in those days, Mario showed you the language in the code on related substances. It had to be both chemically and physiologically related to steroids. So we had to have the new substance, tetrahydrogestrinone or THG, characterized uh, to show that it was chemically related. And we had to do a baboon excretion study to show that it was physiologically related. And it turns out, you'll see here, this is what THG, this is the, the structure of THG, very similar to the existing steroid gestrinone, pretty easy to make THG from gestrinone. So we did the science part. We also put together a web of relationships. Here are the athletes that have had some relationship with Balco. Here are the coaches. And so we had this big web of relationships to see who we ought to target test. It turns out, at about the time that Dr. Catlin came up with an analytical method for THG, he also had the samples from the USA Track and Field National Championships in his lab. And we held off reporting those samples until he was able to develop his method. And three of the athletes that we caught using THG were John McEwen, Kevin Toth, and Mel Melissa Price. Um, they were top-level U.S. athletes. Two of the athletes that we did out-of-competition target testing on were Dwayne Chambers and Regina Jacobs, and they also tested positive. Highly contested cases, as you could imagine, because lots of scientific issues, whether it was chemically related, pharmacologically related, whether the test was reliable and the like. So fast forward to the 2003 World Championships in Athletics, and an American sprinter by the name of Kelly White won the 100 and 200, and then she tested positive for modafinil. And I will tell you that the U.S. laboratories were not testing for modafinil. It's not listed specifically on the prohibited list. It's an anti-narcolepsy drug. Um, but the French were. And it turns out that it was the stimulant of choice for Balco. It doesn't give you the jitters of amphetamine, but it works like a powerful stimulant. Problem is that when we're talking about chemically and pharmacologically related, if you go to the manufacturers of modafinil, they will tell you that it's not a stimulant under the classic definition. They're not sure what it is. Uh, but it works like a stimulant. So we had some issues in that case. Uh, we ultimately prevailed, and there you can see the elite level athletes that we caught with modafinil and won cases against. Right. Right, that's exactly right. If uh, I don't know about Cologne and, and the labs here, but I can tell you the United States labs were not analyzing samples for modafinil until we caught Kelly White. And then obviously they started to, and they went back to the old track and field samples, and that's what they found. And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you more about Kelly White in just a little bit. So... Something very interesting happened. This is a picture of a guy by the name of Patrick Arnold. Uh, Patrick Arnold is a bodybuilder. Patrick Arnold is a chemist. Patrick Arnold was the dope supplier for Victor Conti and the Balco Labs. Um, with the exception of THG, which he designed either on purpose or accidentally, what he was really good at is combing the old patent records for steroids that had been abandoned by the pharmaceutical companies because they were too harsh, uh, and it was okay. He'd give them to his bodybuilder friends. 
He also gave these steroids to Tammy Thomas. We had the hearing in the Tammy Thomas case. It was a little awkward because the chair of the arbitration panel kept referring to her as Tommy instead of Tammy. Um, it was, it was actually, uh, she denied it all the way through. The substance which she was using is norbolethone. So here's what happened. This is the best cyclist, track cyclist, female in the United States. Her drug sample is analyzed by UCLA, shows virtually no natural steroids. They had been suppressed by some exogenous steroid, but she wasn't testing positive. So Don Catlin at UCLA went to the internet, got a lot of chatter about norbolethone, got chatter about Patrick Arnold, went to Wythe Laboratories, who had sold, not sold, they had norbolethone in clinical trials in the 1950s. They were giving it to kids on Indian reservations in Canada. That's the way they did things in those days to deal with stunted growth. And they found that it was way too harsh. It worked. It was a very effective anabolic agent, but it was way too harsh. So Patrick dug that up, and he made it, and he started giving it to athletes. Um, and when we brought our case against Tammy Thomas, she had in a built-in defense. And that was, look at the chemical similarity between norbolethone and levo levonorgestrel. Levonorgestrel is the plan B birth control pill. So when we went back and analyzed her samples, once we figured out and we got a sample of the drug from Wythe Laboratories, we went back and analyzed her samples, and lo and behold, all these samples that had no natural steroids had norbolethone in them. Her defense was it just so happens that the night before, every one of these samples she had had unprotected sex and needed to take the Plan B birth control pill in the morning. So we had great scientific arguments over that and, and other arguments. So while we're talking about Patrick Arnold, this is the structure of androstenedione. dione That was the drug that Mark McGuire, the American baseball player, made famous. We had booming sales. It took our uh, FDA several years to get it listed as a steroid. It's a precursor to testosterone. Patrick Arnold was the guy that made a lot of money on this drug. Notice the language that this is written in. <laughs> this was one of the Balco documents. This was one of the GDR drugs. And Patrick figured those guys knew what they were doing. He would go to those old records, and that's where he copied this from. So obviously, we were talking to Don Catlin a lot as he was developing this test for um, norbolethone and THG. And in one of those conversations, he said, Rich, I, I need to tell you something, but I'm afraid to. And he ultimately said, I have been working with the federal investigators on a lab in San Francisco, and they've told me that I'm not allowed to tell anybody on pain of death. So I'm telling you, please, <laughs> please don't get me killed. <laughs> so we went to the Justice Department and went to the head of the criminal division and said, look, let us tell you what we know about our investigation into doping. And Catlin has said that he is helping a federal criminal investigation. Please don't kill him. There may be some overlap here. You figure it out. Well, two days later, we get a call from Jeff Nowitzki. Jeff is the guy... Uh, he's, he's worked with the IRS. He's now works with DEA and FDA. He's the investigator in all of these U.S. doping cases. Very passionate guy. Uh, he says, I want to come meet with you. He didn't know much about doping at the time. He got our spider web of relationships. He got a full explanation of what kind of substances we could detect, which ones we couldn't detect.
He started out on the tax department. He's now with the, yeah, yeah. There's money laundering involved in all of this if it's a criminal activity. So it's, a, it's pretty much of a one-way street in terms of our providing him information and them not providing us much information. And then we get a call saying that they're going to do a search of the Balco laboratory and they want USADA's chief science director, Larry Bowers, who used to run the Indianapolis laboratory, to go with them. So this is Larry's best day. Larry is a laboratory scientist. They put him in a bulletproof vest, <laughs> and he walks into the laboratory with the agents who have their guns drawn, and, and this is an exciting time for the guy. And it got more exciting because Victor Conti's first reaction was, okay, you got me, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to take you to where I keep my records and where I keep my drugs. So they took Larry along to identify the drugs. And while they were questioning Larry, excuse me, Victor Conti, they said, Larry, you know, check out the drugs here, check out what's in those boxes. What was in the boxes were carefully marked files with athletes' names on them with all sorts of records. And their names like Marion Jones, Tim Montgomery, Michelle Collins, Kelly White. It's the who's who of American athletics and international names as well. And Larry's eyes are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so... Now I will tell you the story of the Balco documents. So we're about uh, nine, ten months away from the Olympic Games. And now we know from Larry that a whole lot of the people that we're going to send to the Athens Olympics and are going to win a lot of medals are dopers. But we need the documents in order to prove that because none of those people tested positive uh, to deal with it. And so we asked the feds, you know, can we have those documents, please? And at first they're going to give them to us, and then they won't give them to us. And there's an issue with our Privacy Act, which the Justice Department was saying, you can't have them. There is one exception to the Privacy Act, and that is documents that have been subpoenaed by the United States Congress. So we went to Senator McCain, who was the head of the committee that oversees our Olympic Committee, and we said, look, the only way we get these documents and avoid a horrible, horrible, horrible embarrassment for the United States is if you subpoena them. And his Commerce Committee said, okay, we'll subpoena them, but we won't promise at all that you're going to get them. We knew that the minute they got them, we would get them because these are a flaming hot potato and no politician wants to have knowledge of all these elite American athletes doping and winning medals. So sure enough, they had hearings, but it took the unanimous consent of the Commerce Committee, it took the unanimous consent of the United States Senate for us to get those documents. Second time in the history of the United States that that's happened. And funny story, there was one copy. We sent Travis Tigert, who was then a lawyer with my firm, and, and he's now the CEO of USADA, to go pick up the documents in a great big duffel bag. And as he was getting in the cab, the chief counsel from the committee said, Travis, watch your back. So... These are some examples of just what those documents look like. Here's a ledger of the drugs that Marion Jones was given right around the time of the Sydney Olympic Games. Same with uh, Christy Gaines. Uh, it shows that she got norbolethone before she competed and then after she competed. This was a calendar that was in the Marion Jones file. You can see her initials MJ at the top. And we have calendars like this on all sorts of the different athletes. So you look at this, and Wednesday's EPO day, and Monday, Wednesday, and Friday is growth hormone day. And intermittently, she would take the clear. 
which was either norbolethone or THG. And you'll notice that throughout this calendar, there are various competitions. When she wasn't competing, she would take more of the clear. The other thing she would take is uh, a cream that was a mix of testosterone and epitestosterone in a ratio that would allow you to take testosterone and still have a TE ratio of around one to one. It was not, yeah, it was a rub-on cream. Um, so Mary, Victor Conti went on television and talked about Marion Jones. Marion Jones started a public relations campaign to clear her name. One of the things she did is she insisted that she would talk with USADA. She came to my office. I questioned her for three hours. And if I wouldn't have seen the documents, I would have swore she was telling the truth. Unbelievably polished and accomplished. And one of the things she said was, you see there that you see there that on the 13th, this couldn't be my calendar because I've never run a 98400. And the answer is, you're right, Marion. That's not your time. That's Tim Montgomery's time. Your time is on his calendar. Yeah, 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 they were married at the time. So this is, a, this is another type of document that we got. This is an email exchange between Michelle Collins and Victor Conti. Uh, here's Michelle saying, Victor, I've got access to testosterone, and I'm wondering if I can use this with the cream that you're already giving me. And Victor's, it's going to cause a positive test by elevating your TE ratio. Whoever told you that's okay is a complete idiot. You're already getting what you need from the cream, which will not elevate the ratio, and you know why. That's a pretty damning email. The other thing we got is a lot of profile information. I mean, Victor's giving people EPO. He's giving them testosterone. He doesn't want them to test positive, and he doesn't want them to die. So they would provide regular laboratory analysis back to Victor. And from those documents we used in the Michelle Collins case, uh, you can see that she had changes in her hematocrit. She had changes in her... Uh, Good, good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, which could be explained by no other reason than doping. So, we brought cases. We sat down and we contacted each of the athletes and said, look, do you want to continue to be part of the problem or you want to be part of the solution? Uh, the only one who agreed to help us, some gave in, um, like Alvin Harrison gave in. Kelly White initially denied, but she was talking with Bill Bach from the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency. Kelly comes from a very religious family. Kelly is a very religious woman herself. Bill is a very religious guy, and while he was interviewing him, her, he pulled out his Bible, and they prayed together, and Kelly decided that she would turn to the, to the good side and told the truth. Bill could do that. I couldn't do that. <laughs> and that was very important because Kelly became our witness who would translate what E and G and C meant on these calendars because she had them all on her calendars too. We had full trials against Michelle Collins, Christy Gaines, and Tim Montgomery. Uh, Marion Jones... Interestingly enough, we were having a tough time putting together the evidence there, and it would be a Lan like a Lance Armstrong case where someone would spend millions and millions and millions defending. Oh, she had lots of law firms. Yeah, she had lots of... Lance had more than that. Um, she had lots of law firms. She had lots of, pers of PR people as well. Um, we got a lucky break. Marion had been married to Tim Montgomery, after we busted Tim Montgomery, he decided he was going to support himself by kiting checks, you know, writing checks from bank to bank to bank so, so that they didn't catch up with him. Turns out he got Marion to sign one of those checks. The feds went to Marion and said, Marion, we could go after you today for check kiting, 
And then when we get the rest of our evidence together, we will go after you for lying to the grand jury when you told them that you didn't dope. Now, the way our criminal system works is first-time loser, second-time loser, much heavier penalty if you've lost twice. So, Marion, you can do these both at once and just be a first-time loser. And so she admitted to the feds that she had lied in her grand jury, and her admission was not complete. Her admission was that she only used the drugs that she lied to the feds about. They didn't ask her about all the drugs, but it was certainly enough for USADA to ban her. So, criminal cases. In the United States, we have a grand jury system. Grand jury testimony is secret. USADA as a private agency, we're not a government agency, will never get grand jury testimony. But if you lie to a grand jury, that's a felony, much more serious than whatever crime you could have committed. If you lie to a federal agent, very serious, much more serious than the typical crime. The name Martha Stewart ring a bell? They were asking her about a stock tip case. She lied to the federal agent in the stock tip case, and she went to prison. I've, I've given variations of, of this presentation to all sorts of different audiences. I was giving it to a group of, of grade schoolers, and they're just young kids, seven, eight, nine years old. The teacher asked them afterwards what they'd learned from the presentation, and you know, Bobby stood up and said, you should never do drugs. And Sarah stood up and said, you should never cheat. And Jimmy stood up and said, you should never, never, never lie to the feds. <laughs> I told him we would hire him when he got old enough. So, Marion, oh, no, this is this is lying to a court, lying to a federal agent when he comes and knocks on your door, is a felony, and that's tough because. Frequently, people will talk to federal agents without their lawyer, and their first reaction is to lie to cover up. And now they have done something much worse than if they would have simply told the truth and had the consequence from that. So Marion went to jail for the lying to the grand jury in check fraud six months. Tammy Thomas, who you saw the picture of, also lied to the grand jury. She got six months house arrest but she'd gone to law school. She'll never be a lawyer because as a convicted felon, you can't practice law in the United States. Here's the Balco entourage cases. Trevor Graham, Marion Jones's, Tim Montgomery's, Christy, er, and uh, uh, Michelle Collins's coach got a year of house arrest for lying to the grand jury. Remy Korchemny, who is Kelly White's coach, got a year probation for... Um, supplying controlled substances. That's his criminal, and then he got a lifetime ban from us. Mark Block, who is Zana Block's coach, agent, and husband. Um, so he got for, for supplying her with banned substances, he got 10 years. And then Raymond Stewart was a follow-up of that. He's a coach, and he got a lifetime ban. So that's on the, that, those are the sporting figures. And the reason we were able to bring cases against the sporting figures is that IAAF at that time, and still does, requires coaches... Uh, and agents to be licensed, and part of their license subjects them to the jurisdiction of the anti-doping agencies. The folks here on the right um, are not subject to anti-doping rules, uh, but they are subject to criminal and professional rules, and you'll see that 
Victor got four months in prison and four months home consi confinement. Uh, Valente, who is his partner, got probation. This guy, Brian Javi Goldman, is a psychiatrist that was ordering all the blood tests and the like for Victor that he would use in checking on his athletes. Uh, he's also the one that came up with the explanation after Kelly White tested positive for modafinil that, oh, yes, she has a family history of narcolepsy, you know, falling asleep in meetings and that he had prescribed modafinil to her for that. Not so good for him when Kelly said, nobody in my family's ever had narcolepsy. This is total nonsense. This is a fraud that Dr. Goldman and Victor made up to try to cover their tracks. So he had his license suspended, and he's on a probation. Patrick Arnold went to prison for three months. Um, and the last one is pretty interesting, Troy Ellerman. Troy is a guy that I knew. He was on the board of directors of the Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association. He was a lawyer in Sacramento, and he was Victor's lawyer. Um, and suddenly, the grand jury transcripts started appearing in the San Francisco Chronicle. And there's only two people that had, two sides that had those transcripts, the prosecutors and the defense. <laughs> well, I wish to hell you would have sent them to us. <laughs> Be because because <laughs> we even we even went to court and tried to get them. It is it is a felony for either the defense or prosecution to let those go. The judge called all the parties in, made them swear that they hadn't given them out. And it turns out it was Troy that gave them out. I think he, th I think he thought that it was unfair that Victor was going to get a longer sentence and other people were getting away with it. I really don't understand what he had in it. Oh, the jo the journalist Mark Fainaruwada, who published these, uh, was called to court and asked, "Who gave you these transcripts?" And his answer was, "I claim journalist privilege." And the judge said, journalist privilege denied. Tell me who gave you those transcripts. He said no. So she put him in jail. She put him in jail. And so, I mean, it made him famous. Uh, so, <laughs> but, he, but he sat in jail. <laughs> and eventually she let him out. And it was, only, it was only when Troy, later as uh, chief executive of the Pro Rodeo Cowboys Association, brought back his investigator to run the Hall of Fame, and then he fired the investigator, that the investigator, out of spite, blew the whole cover. So one of the reasons that, that we've made some progress on this in the United States is because of the passion of people like Jeff Nowitzki, and it also caught the attention of our Attorney General and our President, who decided that it was important that they speak out against doping, which is a good thing because other federal agencies get to be more cooperative when that happens. So USADA is a private organization. It's not a government agency. Uh, we have all the issues that private agencies have with getting information from the government. So what are the pros and cons of of our interaction with the federal agency in the Balco case. One, if they would have never done their search, we would have never seen the Balco documents, and we would have never gotten Michelle Collins, Tim Montgomery, Marion Jones, and the like. And eventually, we did get those documents. Uh, the feds are loath to cooperate in, in sport cases, but we needed somebody to authenticate the documents, and Davitsky came in to our Montgomery hearing and our block hearing to authenticate the documents as having come from Balco's files. Marion Jones would have never pleaded guilty uh, in doping if she wouldn't have had the federal issue over her head. Um, the negatives are that we had to go to Congress to get those documents. 
and it was pretty scary because we were real close to sending dirty athletes to the Olympic Games. The next is something that is at least worth considering as you come up with legislation in Germany. Victor Conti was very willing to testify for us, but he had the criminal case hanging over his head. Every night, the Tim Montgomery hearing lasted about a week. Every night, he would talk to Travis, who was on the case with me, and tell Travis he was going to come into court and testify for us the next day into the arbitration process. So every time the door would open, you would expect to see Victor come through. Victor never came through, and the reason was because he was afraid of the criminal consequence. Um, and then the last issue is that when there are federal cases, be they criminal or in the case of Armstrong, which is a civil fraud claim, the defense will subpoena all of USADA's investigation file that happened in Balco, and it's happened again in Armstrong. And so we have issues trying to protect our work product uh, that we wouldn't otherwise have. So in response to Balco and similar cases around the world, we made a number of changes to the World Anti-Doping Code. We increased the benefit you could give for substantial assistance. We required international federations to be like IAAF and bring athlete support personnel under the jurisdiction of their rules. We said that if you have a positive case, you have to investigate whether athlete support personnel are involved. And lastly, uh, there's a provision that says each government will encourage all of its agencies to share information with anti-doping organizations unless otherwise legally prohibited. That unless otherwise legally prohibited was something that we had to deal with in the 2015 code amendments. So, next, and this will be briefer, U.S. Postal Service investigation. If you want to know what was going on, you can read it in USADA's reasoned decision, 160-some pages with thousands of pages of attachments. It's on USADA's website. It's an interesting read. Okay, good. I mean, I've had, I've had lawyer friends criticize it for not being like a legal brief. And our point was, it wasn't meant to be like a legal brief. It's sort of a mix of a legal brief and a, it was a dark and stormy night as, <laughs> you know, as they climbed uh, the, the 15th stage of the tour. So, chronologically, obviously there had been accusations against Lance all along. USADA keeps a file whenever there are accusations. There was nothing to bring a case on. Floyd Landis comes forward in 2010 and tells the whole doping story to USADA. He also tells it to the feds. And there was one, only really one problem. He did a very good job telling the story. We believed he was truthful, but there was a little bit of a wrinkle because for me to bring that case, I brought the case against Lance. And he lied to me <laughs> under oath in his own trial. And so that's a bit of a problem when isn't it true that the last time Mr. Young asked you a question, you lied to him. So he was telling the truth, but he was a problematic witness. Next guy to come forward was Tyler Hamilton. Very credible. We believed he was telling the truth. He would lied to me, too, in his trial. Um, tough situation to be in. Uh, he also talks to the feds. Yeah, he was... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was the vanishing twin case. He was the vanishing twin. It was, it was actually, it was a bit of a challenging scientific case for me. Their expert was a professor at both Harvard and MIT, 
And he had founded an analytical company that owned the company that owned the company that my expert worked for. <laughs> and so, so he was, I, I knew that he was going to be difficult when he walked into the courtroom and he talked to the court reporter, you know, the transcriber, about what kind of system she was using and he plugged his computer into her machine so he got live transcript as he was sitting there in the courtroom. He, but he was also the most arrogant person in the history of the world. And this is, this is a bit of a digression, but so he starts out his testimony just talking like very, very quiet, barely, barely talking. And the panel asks him to speak up. And he said, well, would you mind, you know, I'm used to lecturing in a classroom. Would you mind if I gave my testimony standing? So there he was lecturing all of us. And he would look down, Mr. Young, do you understand that? And just totally arrogant. So when it was time for my cross-examination, uh, he's standing there, and I said, you can sit down now. And he said, oh, I'd prefer to stand. And I said, I know you would. I'd prefer that you sit down like a normal witness. And he looked at the panel, and they said, sit down. And interestingly enough, this guy who's very, very bright, it broke. He broke right there. He, he turned out to be a terrible witness on cross-examination. So. so, federal case against uh, Lance Armstrong. Based on the information from Landis and Hamilton, the feds start a very thorough investigation. They go to international agencies. They do interviews with writers. They do grand jury testimony with writers. Um, at their request, and this is another issue to deal with in the interplay of statutes, the feds asked us to stand down USADA's investigation because they didn't want us interviewing witnesses at the same time they were interviewing witnesses. So we stood down, and it was our assumption, and it was Jeff Nowitzki's assumption and the lawyers involved in the case, that the case would go forward and then as a complete surprise to everyone, on, yeah, on the Friday before Super Bowl, where the entire news in the, in the United States is about the Super Bowl, the U.S. attorney in Los Angeles says they're dropping the investigation. Don't know why. I mean, I've heard lots of great theories, but don't know why. <laughs> Could have been politics. Could have been particular politicians. Could have been that we're entering into an economic doldrum in the United States, and they spent a lot of money on the Balco case, and you know you got four months jail for Victor, and you have the Roger Clemens case that didn't work out so well, the Barry Bonds case didn't work out so well, and there was a legit legitimate criticism that you're wasting a whole bunch of taxpayer money on these doping cases. That could have been it. Could have been lots of reasons. Um, so that meant that USADA had to resume its investigation. So we know we can't get the grand jury transcripts, but they did lots and lots of witness interviews. They did examination of documents. They had international documents. And so we asked for that information. And they wouldn't give them to us. This is the feds. They wouldn't give them to us. Their explanation was that we are still considering whether we will join a federal fraud suit that Floyd Landis brought as a whistleblower. And if we join that suit, we may not want you to have all those documents. And so you know what? We never got them. We never got those federal investigative files, which would have been wonderful for us. Uh, but we got a very good break, which was we went to the cyclists that were on Armstrong's team. And we said, same thing that we always say, do you want to be part of the solution or do you want to continue to be part of the problem? And they started telling us the truth. Now, the key question in how these investigations work is, why did they start telling us the truth? And I'm sure they all had slightly different reasons. 
But first, the code of silence had already been broken by Landis and Hamilton. Second, they knew that they were going to have to testify before the grand jury and talk to the feds. And they knew that they sure didn't want to lie to them. So sooner or later, they were going to have to tell the truth to somebody. And a number of them were before the grand jury. I don't know what they said, but I assume that they told the truth. Third, having told the truth once, it felt pretty good. Because this is a pretty heavy secret to be carrying around with you. Having told the truth once, felt pretty good. They were willing to do it again. Fourth, Armstrong had bullied and badgered and and crushed a number of people who had simply told the truth. Oh, threatened, t terribly threatened, total bully. And so this is a chance for those people to be exonerated. And so when these cyclists came out, they knew that they were speaking out for the people that Armstrong had crushed. And then last, under the code, we were able to give them a reduced ban from two years to six months. The other thing, the other piece of the Armstrong case was profile information. It was along the lines of the athlete's biological passport, but it turns out that his percentage of reticulocytes, these are the baby red blood cells, were radically different when he was competing in the 2009 and 10 Tour de France than they were during periods where he wasn't competing in the Tour de France. They were way lower, which suggests that something was happening in his system to suppress the generation of more red blood cells. And usually that something is you are reinfusing your own blood, and so your body's saying we don't need any more red blood cells. The other thing that we found is, particularly during the 2009 tour, his plasma volume and his red blood cell volume were very unique. Usually when you're in a long distance event, a multiple day event like the Tour de France, your red blood cell percentage goes down and down and down and down and down. And as a matter of fact, that's what's happened to Lance's red blood cell percentage in other races. In the 2009 Tour de France, started here, it goes down and down and down, and then it goes up again, and then it goes down and down and down, and then it goes up again. And there's no reason that it would go up unless you were reinfusing new blood. We also got a lot of help from WADA their investigator, Jack Robertson, and international agencies. If you look at the recent decision, you will see thousands of pages of, uh, of exhibits. Some of those exhibits are from the Italian police with bank records from Dr. Ferrari, making it clear that when Lance and his agent, Bill Stapleton, told the world over and over and over that they disassociated with Dr. Ferrari in 2004, that they continued to pay him large sums of money. Yep. Yep. Yeah, he was one of, and, and he's one of the affidavits in the reasoned decision. Um, so, in terms of writers who's been sanctioned, obviously Lance, lifetime ban. The six others whose names and declarations are in the reasoned decisions who got six months. And then this is an ongoing process as a result of what happened in the Armstrong case. Lots of other writers, and you know who they are, have come forward and admitted their doping. Some have been convicted in cases, and that story is still going on. So sport disciplinary cases arising out of Armstrong and Postal Service. At the bottom, you'll see the provision in UCI rules which says that we had jurisdiction over anyone uh, who participates in a UCI event. And they weren't licensed, but the doctors and the trainers, by participating, have agreed to jurisdiction. We brought cases against Johan Bruniel and Dr. Moral, 
and Dr. Salea and uh, trainer Pepe Martin. Um, Ferrari, Ferrari and Dr. Demeral did not challenge the cases and they got lifetime bans. Brunil, uh, Salea and the trainer Pepe Martin did challenge and that matter has been heard in a USADA AAA hearing uh, that was held in London and we are awaiting a decision. So the other thing that's happened to Lance, I mean, we've talked about the criminal consequence. There's no, there's no criminal case pending against him now. We've talked about the doping consequence, but there are also civil consequences. Uh, he sued the Sunday Times and got a settlement. When it, when it turns out they were telling the truth and he was lying, they sued him back. That case was settled. He had two different insurance policies that provided, where the team took out an insurance policy, they said, we'll give Lance a bonus if he wins one, two, three, four, five tours. And they insured that contract with these companies. Uh, those are the depositions where Lance lied over and over in the depositions. The One of those is settled. The other big one is still pending. And the big case is the case that was initiated by Floyd Landis, which basically says, so the Postal Service, the United States Postal Service, was a sponsor of this team, and they got representations from the team that nobody on the team was doping. And that was important because there were the rumors of the doping, obviously. and. Um, based on these representations, they went ahead and paid uh, his team some $30 million. And that would be fraud on the federal government. And under the statutes, fraud on the federal government gets treble damages plus interest. So the amount in controversy in that case is in excess of $100 million. And they didn't just go after Lance and the team. They went after all the money guys behind the team. So if you go down that list of names like Thomas Weisel, these are big guys. These are big guys with a lot of money. So very interesting case. Floyd brought that case. It was only very late in the game that the federal government decided that they wanted to join. And so in the irony of ironies, as the whistleblower who brought the case, Floyd Landis will be entitled to about 20% of whatever they recover. <laughs> Interesting, interesting cycle of, of Floyd's life. Um, pros and cons. I'm not sure that the writers would have talked to us if they wouldn't have had the threat of the feds. The fact that the feds were doing it made it clear that the truth would come out sooner or later. Uh, our feds worked with international law enforcement. That was very helpful. The bad things were they delayed our investigation while they were doing their ours, their own, that they cut short, and we never got the documents. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but these are just a handful of the changes <laughs> that now appear in the 2015 code that aid investigations and put a tighter focus on uh, doping by athlete support personnel. One of the interesting ones and one of the controversial ones was Article 210 of the Code, the Prohibited Association. We knew that Tim Montgomery and Marion Jones were working out with Ben Johnson's coach, who was banned for life. And there's nothing we could do about it. We couldn't. He's banned for life. What are we going to do to the guy? And there was no way that we could tell Tim or Marion not to use this guy. Victor Conti was at the London Games guy who's been convicted criminally of doping athletes. There's no way we could tell athletes, you can't use this guy. Well, Article 210 changes that. Last comment. So is there anything special that led to the success USADA had in the Belco and Postal Service cases? I'd point to two things. I'd point to leadership and independence. 
both USADA's executive team and the board of directors had a very clear focus on what the purpose of the agency was, and that was to fight doping. And so either the Balco case or the Armstrong case could have been life-threatening for the agency. It certainly would have been job terminating for the CEOs if we would have lost those cases. And there was a good chance. You never knew how that would turn out. We never dreamed that they would both turn out as well as they did. There was a good chance that something bad would happen. But when USADA looked at it, it was a very clear decision. We have one mission, and that's to fight doping. And we have a case that should be brought. And we realize that the consequence of losing that case could be the death of the agency. But you know what? If we're not going to bring that case, we deserve to die anyhow. And so that's what happened. We went forward knowing that there was a big risk. The second characteristic is independence. The U.S. Anti-Doping Agency is an independent, nonprofit organization. Yes, we get government funding. Yes, we get funding from the Olympic Committee. But the decisions stay within the USADA Board of Directors. On both Balco and Armstrong, we had congressmen calling us up to appear before them to, dis to explain why it is that we're attacking national treasures. But there's no way that the government or the Olympic Committee or any national federation could interfere directly. And so the independent board approved what the independent CEO wanted to do. And that's why when you look at the 2015 code, you will see a new provision that requires that um, national anti-doping organizations be operationally independent from both government and national Olympic committees. And that's it. Thanks.